And what he did was to integrate the suburbs. That is, he thought of the, of the, of the city as, as a much more lar large-scale organism. He thought about it in terms of the park system as breathing spaces for that city. He thought about it in terms of communications which were you know, you know, city-wide, the large boulevards and all the rest of it. He thought about it as water supplies and sewage disposal and all those kinds of things on an integral kind of basis. He, he replanned whole neighborhoods like Leal and all the rest of it. And, and he just has changed the scale. And I think the most wonderful moment where this became clear was when an architect called Hittorf had been very active in the 1830s and 1840s in trying to replan Paris, came to him almost just shortly after Haussmann came to Paris with a plan for a new boulevard. And he showed the plan to Haussmann, and Haussmann just took one look at it and said, not wide enough. You have it 40 meters wide, I want 120 meters wide. And that's why you see the boulevards in Paris the way they are right now because that was Hausmann's scale of thinking. He changed the scale of thinking about the city, and in so doing, of course, he absorbed vast amounts of capital and labor in a project which worked very successfully in stabilizing the situation, along, of course, with the other aspect of what Louis Bonaparte did, which was to institute a police state. That is, he took everybody who was likely to be oppositional, any leftist, and he basically put them under surveillance or he exiled them or something like that. He controlled the press, he censored the press, he even censored the songs on the boulevard so that if you tried to sing a song on the boulevard but you sounded the least bit critical, you found yourself in prison immediately. So it was a very authoritarian state politically at the same time as it was doing this other major, major project. It was those two things that went on. Now, in order for that project to work, Haussmann needed to construct new financial institutions that were going to permit him the financial wherewithal to do this project. So they invented new institutions, the Credit Immobilier, Immobilier, and they put all kinds of other uh, credit institutions, and, and Haussmann's uh, own finances were put on a different kind of basis. And these new financial institutions, in, in effect, allowed a debt-financed a development project to unfold in Paris which, since it was credit finance, could absorb the surplus product through you create a fictitious capital, it goes out there, it pays for something, then you build something, and then the building of, the, of it realizes the value in that, uh, in real terms of what that initial fictitious capital was about. This is how it worked. And it worked very well in Paris until about 1868 when somebody, and you'll recognize where I'm going to go with this, somebody said, What's inside of those credit institutions? Is there anything inside there? And by the way, what's inside of these state finances? Is there anything inside there? And when they prodded very hard, they found there's nothing much inside there. So all of a sudden, there's a financial crisis. The big kind of financiers fall from grace. Perrier brothers kind of fall from grace. Haussmann's capacity to do the works collapses. Uh, the whole kind of project comes to an end, and Louis Napoleon, kind of in a mess, decides to do what other people do in situations of this kind. He decided to pick a quarrel with Germany, go to war with Germany, and he lost disastrously. So that was the kind of, if you like, the end of that project with, however, a footnote, a big footnote. And the big footnote was, at the end of this project, you suddenly find something called the Paris Commune which is an attempt to retake the city, remake the city, more after somebody else's heart's desire than what had gone on in the 1850s and 1860s. Because Haussmann's project had simply not about, been about urban infrastructures. It had also been about a whole lifestyle change. I and mean, this is the time when Paris suddenly starts to take on things like cafe life. This is when the, the boulevards become fashion display areas. This is the time of spectacles like the the, the universal expositions. This is the kind of this is the kind of point where a flippant kind of consumerist culture takes over, and a lot of the bourgeoisie are very upset by this. A lot of conservatives are very upset by this, by this kind of you know world of uh, uh, of, uh, of make believe that is, uh, and, and people feel they've lost their city. So there's this literature that appears towards the end of the 1860s that kind of says we've lost our city. It's been taken away from us by all of this kind of reinvestment, all of this flippant kind of lifestyle, and furthermore, it's been taken away 
from another segment by, from the working classes who were expelled from the city by a massive kind of gentrification project which pushed them further and further out into the suburbs. So they wanted to retake the city as well in terms of their own class project. And so the Paris Commune was not simply an opportunistic revolt. It was a revolt against the urban lifestyle that had been constructed in the 1850s and the 1860s and an attempt to remake the city more after a kind of socialist, uh, communitarian kind of, kind, of, kind of project. Now, that story is, I think, instructive because it helps us understand all kinds of things that have happened since then. I want to fast forward now to the year 1942. Look at the situation in the United States in 1942. You've gone through a period of the 1930s where capital and labor were unemployed. You had a crisis of capitalism. Nobody knew how to take the surplus capital. Nobody knew what to do with the surplus labor. Nobody knew what to do with it. Roosevelt had tried <coughs> to reestablish through the New Deal, but it hadn't really worked. In 1938, there was another depression. The, 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 sort of the public works project was, was too small. It didn't really do what it was supposed to do. So in effect, the whole thing was rescued by the war effort, by suddenly capital and labor fully employed in the war effort, which then raises the problem, what are you going to do after the war is over? And since 1942, there started to be some very serious thinking about what on earth are we going to do? If, after the war is over, you suddenly find a massive number of people who have been in the army coming back and they're going to be unemployed, we're going to have a revolution on our hands. Furthermore, during the 1930s, you had a, a communist party beginning to articulate ideas. You had uh, radical opposition in movements emerging. And even worse, in 1942, you're in alliance with the Soviet Union. What on earth are you going to do politically? And even, even much more worse was the very simple fact that this country in the 19th, in those, that period of the uh, uh, Second World War had a totally planned economy. It had a centrally planned economy. And it was one of the most efficient centrally planned economies you could possibly imagine. If you go back and you look, all the corporations were essentially under federal control. They were doing corp federal business, and it was all orchestrated into the war effort. It was an incredible kind of thing with natural resource planning, everything going on, on inside of it. So in 1942, the bourgeoisie starts to get terrified politically about what's going to happen after the war. And so what does it do? In 1942, it really started to, to, to start uh, the anti-red hunt. This is where McCarthyism had its beginnings. It had its beginnings in World War II as the bourgeoisie started to say, we've got to get rid of the reds, we've got to suppress the reds, we've got to suppress all of this left wing thinking, we've got to suppress all of this stuff, and, and, and therefore anti-communism is, is where it's at. And so you start to get this ideological push. Uh, the House of Long American Activities Committee starts, and of course after the war you get McCarthyism and all the rest of it, suppression of all left thought in this country politically. So that was, if you like, the political side which began to be articulated around 1942. But what about the economic side? What on earth were they going to do? And what on earth was, was the world going to be like? Well, in 1942, there appeared a very interesting article in a journal called Architectural Forum. And the article was about Haussmann, and what Haussmann had done with Paris. And it was an elaborate discussion of incredible kind of ways in which Haussmann had set labor and capital to work and how the redesign of the city and everything else was understood and, and, and analyzed Haussmann's triumphs and, 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 his, and his achievements and his mistakes. And the article was, was by none other than Robert Moses. And of course, Robert Moses had been attempting in the 1930s to actually you know, use state power around the highways, that kind of thing in New York. But after 1945, he has the power to actually start to com completely redesign the whole New York metropolitan region. But notice something here. In exactly the same way, and Haussmann changed the scale of thinking. Haussmann changed the scale of thinking. It was no longer about the city. It was about the metropolitan region. And it was about the suburbanization of the metropolitan region. It was a vast kind of suburbanization project that was going to be absolutely set up in a way that was you know, really you know, kind of capable of, of absorbing uh, the surplus 